This morning, we take a break from the lectionary to ponder one of my favorite scripture passages. One of the reasons the lectionary is in place is to avoid this, but alas. It is a story about a female disciple of the early church named Tabitha. Tabitha, also called Dorcas. Not to be confused with Dorcas. Okay, fine. Dorcas, Dorcas, Dorcas. Though the book of Acts stands alone in the New Testament, it is the second volume of a story that began with the Gospel of Luke. Now you're probably wondering, who is Tabitha? Well, Tabitha is the only woman in Acts given the title disciple, which in Greek means student or pupil, and it is the only occurrence of the feminine form of disciple found in the New Testament. When it comes to women in the Bible, some have gone to great lengths to cover up and even change the text to diminish the role of women. Powerful women became prostitutes, and their names changed, especially those in leadership. It wasn't until I was in seminary that I heard anything about Tabitha. Tabitha's ministry to the community of Joppa was in service to those in need, sewing garments for those who were without, and she didn't do it alone. She worked alongside a community of widows. Now, resurrection happens in our scriptures only a handful of times, and the story of Tabitha happens to be one of them. So as you listen, imagine with me what is left unsaid. Pay attention to who is present in the story and yet unnamed. Our reading today is from the book of Acts 9, uh, verses 36 through 42. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had her washed, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, The disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, Please, come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows were beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Some of the stories that I particularly enjoy sharing during the Christmas season are about my big grandma, Santa Temperino Erin. Big grandma was 10 years old in 1908 when she and her mother and her father left the shores of Sicily and made their voyage to America, the land of opportunity and prosperity. They were among many thousands of hopeful immigrants who were waiting in long lines at Ellis Island, ready to embrace their new life not knowing fully what would become of their family. I wonder what questions they had as they waited. Probably the basics. Where will I sleep? When will I have our next meal? Where will we put down roots? My great aunt Claudette was the master storyteller in my family, and she would tell stories about Big Grandma and how she named all of her daughters after famous actresses and opera singers. Aunt Claudette was named after Claudette Colbert, a French-born actress that debuted on Broadway and was a sensation. Grandma always said that her daughter's personalities matched the people she named them after. Aunt Leslie, Leslie Curran, Aunt Debbie, Deborah Kerr, Elisa, well, my grandmother. Big Grandma just loved the name Elisa. Aunt Claudette would talk about Big Grandma's recipes, Every time we had a family get together, my Aunt Claudette would make some of the recipes from this cookbook that she had created after years of spending time cooking with my big grandma. But big grandma never wrote down her recipes. 
but this was her masterpiece, from the kitchen of Mariana Palmisano Temperina Cascon, mother of Santa Temer Temperino Aaron. I consider this to be my family heirloom. It's so precious to me. Big Grandma was a force. Even after she lost her vision from an accidental error with medicine, she was still sharp as a whip. I imagine she had to be. Women had just run the right to vote during my Big Grandma's young adult years. I don't remember my aunt saying very much about the men in the family, though. But the kitchen was her domain and she had a clear understanding of who was the authority in the family. Nothing could slip by her. My aunt said that when they would try to sneak a snack, she always knew, and she'd throw down the knife just short of their fingers. I suppose these stories, and, and stories that speak to our sense of ancestry and identity, are in, important because in the great ocean of life, they anchor us. It's human nature to want to feel significant in some way. And oh, how a cookbook can make you feel like you have a place. But I wonder what stories I never heard from my Aunt Claudette and my grandma. Where was my big grandpa? And who was my father? When did they leave the Catholic Church? What stories have I forgotten? What stories do I not care to tell? What stories will no longer be shared because over the generations they were lost? This theme of forgotten history is significant for all of us and to us as Christians. Most of us experience feelings of loss as we feel the distance between our lives and big, biblical times. Wanting to discern what of our scriptures portrays what actually happen, happened during the birth of Christianity. This has certainly been the case as I've studied the book of Acts. In fact, reading Acts has left me pretty certain that women were integral to the early church and that Luke didn't really want the reader to know that. He had his reasons. If we look to the first chapter of Acts, it might appear on a first reading that the early church leadership was exclusively male, composed of the remaining 11 apostles but a closer look can offer evidence of the presence of women in the text who were more than glorified groupies. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was present, along with certain women. Who were those mysterious characters? Some scholars have argued that Luke, to gain the favor of the Roman Empire, diminished the role of women in Acts, focusing on the ministries of Peter and Paul. After all, Luke's goal for Acts was that it be the story of Paul's ministry that propelled the expansion of the gospel across the world. All other characters are therefore supporting or ensemble roles. Luke was clearly concerned with his audience, and he knew what was necessary to interest the men of the Roman Empire who would be his readers, where men occupied leadership roles and women were absent from the public arena. It was too risky to portray women as leaders of the early church because, frankly, it wouldn't sell. Clearly, this is not the case in modern times. By the way, have you heard about Reverend Lillian's new book, When Spiritual But Not Religious Is Not Enough? Though male leadership isn't the model in our own church, 2,000 years later, there continues to be a struggle in more conservative pockets of Christianity to hold on tightly to the reins of patriarchy. In early 2012, Reverend John Piper, pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, held a conference called God, Manhood, and Ministry, Building Men for the Body of Christ. A Christian Post article offering highlights of the conference shared some of Piper's brilliance. God intended Christianity to have a masculine feel. God revealed himself throughout the Bible as king, not queen. The second person of the Trinity is revealed as the eternal son, not daughter. And don't worry, all you ladies out there, Piper claims that God did this for the flourishing of both men and women. So you all have nothing to worry about. I was struck that much of his points didn't dive deeper than gendered language. Pronouns don't define the essence of gender. 
Piper explained that the attributes, though, that are modeled in the Bible that give Christianity that distinctly masculine feel are bravery in the face of criticism, boldly teaching scriptural doctrines in ways that press forward to wise application in life, even when those truths are hard to hear. Are these attributes merely representative of masculinity? I don't believe God intended Christianity to have a masculine feel at all. I think that's putting words in the mouth of God. In fact, it's selectively interpreting scriptures, and there are plenty of examples of God in the feminine in our scriptures. Isaiah 49:15 depicts God as a nursing mother. Hosea 13:8 depicts God as a mother bear. In Deuteronomy 32:11, God is depicted as a mother eagle, and then again in Deuteronomy 32 God gives birth. We find similar images of the feminine throughout our scriptures. Jeremiah, the Psalms, the Gospel of Matthew, and Luke. I also happened upon Piper's online question and answer page where listeners can email questions in, and he responds. One woman writes in, Should women become pastors? Piper explained that God meant for men to be the head of the household, and when men do this in a God way, then they show themselves ready to lead the church. God didn't intend this authority for women. And he cites off Genesis 1 through 2, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 2. I grew up in a church community with similar beliefs. It was this theology that drove me out of those churches. There was no room for me there. I pray that this is good news for churches like ours in the UCC. But I can't help but feel the insecurity at the heart of these statements. When we allow our insecurities to control us, we often feel the need to dominate people and resources to give us a false sense of power. But feelings of authentic significance can never come by diminishing another person or group. Feeling significant is only born of love. Biblical writer Rachel Stone claims that perhaps these pastors are seeing the writing on the wall, and it scares them. The church is 50% or more female. Church leadership is shifting and steadily growing more female leaders. And certainly outside the church, both in higher education and in the workforce, women are outperforming men. But really... There is another issue emerging. Some argue that perhaps it's the hyper-masculine, ultra-controlling rhetoric that is doing more to increase the exodus of the church, especially of the nuns, the 16% of the population that never grew up in a religious community. One way that we can examine the way that men and women are treated differently in Acts is in the story of Tabitha. In verse 39 from our passage, Tabitha is praised for her acts of charity to the widows of Joppa. This is the only place where acts of charity is used in all of Acts. But in Acts 6, 4, male disciples provide service of care and of the word to widows, which in the Greek translates to ministry. Why is it that men were were charged with service to the widows and orphans? and it's considered ministry, while Tabitha's work is considered good works. While Luke offers us a snapshot into the world of women in the New Testament, but it's one of scattered references and women who function in the backdrop as patrons and philanthropists rather than key players in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For years, I found this imbalance so troubling, I couldn't even pick up a Bible. But over time, I came back, and I tried to read for glimpses of women disciples, and it gave me hope. And they are certainly there if you read the text carefully. There are many more present than we realize, though often unnamed. The ones that are named, such as Tabitha, we can look to for clues. Rachel Held Evans writes about these themes in her blog, Women of Valor, and recent book, Year of Biblical Womanhood. She makes the claim that Tabitha being named disciple, or mathetria, means that Tabitha likely studied directly under Jesus, like Mary of Bethany. 
This gives us a very different image of Tabitha than merely what the text supports. Although we can see evidence that Luke upheld Greco-Roman gentlemen's codes of decorum, we are still blessed with traces of women in scripture that lead us to different conclusions. Perhaps Tabitha's ministry was both good works and sharing the good news. In seminary, I often would practice a process of imaginative remembering where I would share the story through my own lens. And I found myself doing this while reading this text. Imagine with me. Tabitha is sewing clothes. She has fostered a community of widows and the otherwise destitute of Joppa. From her crafting of her her garments and the time spent distributing them among the widows, among the forgotten ignored, Tabitha has become their family. For they are the ones that Tabitha has given her life to. But something terrible has happened. Tabitha has become ill and dies. What will happen to the women of Tabitha's community now that she has passed? She was their leader. She had given them so much. What now? But they couldn't do it couldn't put Tabitha in the grave, and so they began the ritual washing of the body and the preparations. Even though as a Jew they were supposed to bury her that day, they just couldn't. And then it came to them. What about the upper room? Tabitha herself had told them about the power of that day. Tabitha had told them about the resurrection. But how? Time was running out. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter and Paul were near, and they sent two men for Peter, saying, Come, without delay. Even though it had been more than half a day, the women had been in prayer for their mother, leader, and friend. At times, each of them would become overcome with hopelessness, and they would hug each other and lift their spirits, singing the song that Tabitha always sang to them. And when they saw Peter walking towards the house, their hearts nearly leaped from their chests. They were not sure he would come, but he did. And they knew that soon, soon they would be reunited with Tabitha. They quickly invited him to join them in the upper room of the house. And when he entered into the upper room, he saw tunics placed around the bed that Tabitha had made. He walked towards her, and the women surrounded around he and Tabitha, and the power in that room made their skin tingle and their stomachs churn. Something miraculous was happening. They heard Peter ask them to wait outside the room, but they knew that God would bring Tabitha back to life. Peter commanded Tabitha to get up, and she did. He didn't even have to call for the widows. They knew the second the life came back into Tabitha's body, they came rushing into the room, and Tabitha looked inflamed, and she embraced the women of her church, praising God and rejoicing, for their faith was strong. Perhaps there is more to the story than we read in Acts. Admittedly, when I read the story, I found myself uh, really annoyed with Peter in verse 40. It says that Peter put them all outside. And what was going on here? Performance anxiety? What I found strange was clearly the women were acting together and supporting each other and working alongside each other. And now Peter is shoving them out the door. Perhaps Peter wasn't used to working with others. He was so used to being a lone ranger. I wonder if it added to the persona of the rugged, heroic miracle worker. Luke sets this up in chapter 9, with Peter healing Aeneas in the passage before Tabitha. Maybe Peter was really soaring on adrenaline, and his ego became the healing ingredient. When we see Jesus performing miracles, however, It's often with the disciples in public places, in the streets, and in the marketplace. And Jesus repeatedly credits the faith of the individual seeking the miracle for its occurrence. 
But what I see in the story of Tabitha are two different paradigms of ministry, one that is done in relationship with others over shared work, and the other a lone ranger hoarding control. It's clear to me that these church ladies loved Tabitha. I think their faith in Jesus Christ motivated them to act with bravery and with authority, and thank you very much, Mr. Piper. Otherwise, they wouldn't have called for Peter. I believe this church of widows wouldn't have stopped at any lengths to help Tabitha because they loved her. The community wasn't a flashy ministry. It was to the poor and the widows and the orphans. And their ministry was motivated out of love of God and each other. That was enough. I don't think that Peter show, showing up and shoving the ladies out of the room made Tabitha's resurrection any more possible. Now, I want to make a confession. I've imagined this text as we did before, entirely excluding Peter from the story. And honestly, it felt really good like momentary retribution of sorts, as if it made up for all the internalized pain that I'd ever had when reading the Bible. But of course, this was short-lived, as the Holy Spirit reminded me that I would wake up and step off my throne. But the work of the kingdom of God is united. It invites relationship, loving across difference. We need to acknowledge that when we want to lift ourselves up as better than others, as more superior than another, we are not motivated by God. In fact, Jesus' model modeled the opposite of this for us. Our God, who came into the world, became human, born to an unwed, homeless teenager, and in his adult life chose to be in relationship with the outcast, the difficult, and the smelly. We can even learn about relationship from our Trinitarian understanding of God, three in one. Some have argued that there is a hierarchy to the Trinity. The Father supersedes the Son, the Son supersedes the Holy Spirit. I think this is a misunderstanding of God as well. I think that the Trinity offers us an understanding of how relationships should be, not privileging one over another. One's sense of self and identity is uniquely defined by the relationships one has, so much that a person could not be themselves if it wasn't for the relationships they had. Let's pause and think about what we can take away from this. No, we're not biblical fundamentalists, and most of us today agree that the diminishing of women from Scripture is terrible. What can we take away? I think there's important learning here for us as we evaluate our relationships and our models of ministry. If our identity and sense of self is uniquely shaped by those whom we're in relationship with, then we better pay attention to whom we are in relationship with. Are they of similar incomes, race, gender, educations? And who aren't we in relationship with? If our friends are replicas of ourselves, are we limiting ourselves? And consider our ministries. If our ministries are centered around relationships, or are they all about working by ourselves? I think that the widows of Tabitha's community, though unnamed, are the heroes of the story. But really, it's not about the heroes. It's not even about Peter, the miracle worker. Luke's price paid for the expansion of the gospel was to leave women in the margins. And feelings of authentic significance can never come by diminishing another person or group. Feeling significant is only born of love, not insecurity, not fear. Love is what motivated Tabitha's Church of Widows in their shared ministry. And that was enough. Amen.